Hey folks, it's Michael with The Reason RX Podcast. So, today we're going to talk about a gentleman, we're going to talk to a gentleman, an interview, um, who I know from a podcast called The Education Bookcast. It's one I recommend. He does some good stuff. Um, talks about books about education and what you can learn from them. And one thing I like is because he doesn't, for example, do as a lot of people do and think, okay, I teach math, so I just need to know more math and know more about math teaching and let me just study that and just focus on that and hyper-focus. An important thing about teaching and learning and thinking and being human is to integrate. Cognitive integration is a fundamental logical skill. And so I like that this guy talks about and tries to learn from Bruce Lee and books about Bruce Lee John Wooden, the basketball coach, um, game design, other things. You can see, um, I'll put a link to his podcast in the show notes, and you can look up some of them, listen to him, see his discussion. Um, so that's an important thing, looking broadly to find out how to do things. Like, for example, a teacher might want to look into theater or acting to know how to make the classes more interesting. Um, look at writing literature and how that's done to know how to pace things better. Um, and then he also gets into really good discussion um, in depth about this. It's not superficial. That's another good, important thing about reasoning and being logical, which clearly helps us teach better, produce better students, think better, live a better life. Um, so he'll look at whether some idea is valid, if he believes it, what the research is, um, how it relates to something else, some good thinking skills involved there. Um, that's what I like. So, without further ado, to use a phrase I heard recently that I've forgotten for, that I haven't said for a while, um, I'll let him introduce himself and tell us about his background and his podcast and what he does. So, hello, would you introduce yourself and pronounce your name? Hello, uh, I'm Stash, that's short for... Stanisław Strokoński, so you can just use Stash if you want. What uh, I'm nationality in, is that? Sorry. Uh, it's Polish, yeah. Okay. That's why so I didn't I'm, try to I'm, pronounce I'm, it. I'm <laughs> Polish origin, gentleman. yeah. I yeah. didn't want so, to butcher it. <laughs> <Go> ahead, <sorry>. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I'm in London, so I might be your furthest away uh, uh, sort of colloquia so far. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, uh, I have a podcast, as you mentioned, thank you very much for the inter introduction called Education Bookcast, uh, which I started about four years ago, because uh, I was basically my career had moved into education at that stage into teaching essentially full time. Um, and I wanted to improve and I, I thought that, you know, what ways could I possibly improve as someone involved in this? And I thought I needed to know more about the education research, of which there is a huge amount. And so I started reading lots of books. And I read, in the first year of that, I read 60 books. Hmm. And I also was trying to get information from other sources because I felt like I couldn't get the information fast enough. And looking at podcasts was one way to look at it. And there were some about books as well. And I thought maybe I can learn about books without having to always read them or at least know beforehand what I'm getting into. Uh, but mostly they seem to be interested in... For example, um, they wouldn't get into the content of the books enough, so I wouldn't really know what was going on. And eventually I just realized I could be the one to do this because I have enough free time comparatively to other uh, teachers, for example, because I was doing uh, private stuff. You don't have as much admin and you don't have as many hours. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's how I got into that. And I've been doing that for four years. And um, hopefully I've learned a lot. I feel like there's still much left mm -hmm. Well, rather, I feel like uh, there are, there have also been things that at first I believed, or at first I had certain kinds of uh, ideas which have changed, yeah. which uh, obviously is likely to happen when you're going through a long journey like this. Um, so that's that's pretty much me, I guess. I mean, I've also worked in some uh, educational technology startups in London as well, um, working on literacy uh, and on uh, kind of e-learning platforms and stuff so that's another side of stuff that i've been doing um so i guess that's a, a good enough introduction yeah so you've been involved in ed education in four years or for four years or more than four or? uh well four years is how long the podcast has been around um i get this is the first year the first academic year where i'm not teaching since 2010 hmm. 
so I have I have been doing teaching at least a bit for uh, you know some form of teaching for for the past say about eight years, and then recently I've also done some uh, some work in um, educational technology in, in the meantime as well. That was partly side projects, and then it actually was a full time job for the last uh, year and a half. Cool. Um, did you start teaching just out of college, or have some other jobs, or what? I was I was an engineer for a year and a half. It it didn't go so well, <laughs> and then and then I ended up getting into teaching instead. Cool. What kind of engineer were you? Chemical engineering. Okay, like bachelor's or PhD or what? Well, I had I had a master's degree in engineering, and uh, I worked in a in a engineering consultancy. But, okay. But, yeah. Cool. Um, and so you taught mainly literacy or math or science or what? Oh, predominantly uh, math and science, yeah. Um, li- literacy, actually, I got a lot into when I was working in a, a certain educational uh, company where literacy was the main focus. So I ended up learning a lot about reading and that sort of thing, vocabulary. Mm-hmm. And then when you've taught in school, has this been math and science? So I have taught in school and I've taught maths in school. Um, but out of school, uh, I've been, I've done private tuition or private tutoring, or I've taught for various sort of private organizations, private classes, which was, uh, also maths and science. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, math courses have you taught in science? Which in particular? Uh, I think it might be that the system over here is a bit different <clears throat> and there's kind of a unitary, much more unitary, uh, approach. It's not, it's not quite so modular. So, I, I mean, okay. I haven't, I haven't done that much biology to be fair. It's mostly physics and chemistry, mm-hmm. but, um, but yeah, in maths, like I've taught everything up to a little further maths and step exams, step exams, these special exams you take to get into Cambridge university, mm-hmm. um, like a level further maths, a level is sort of like the high school diploma thing, but you choose your specific subject. Further maths is when you kind of do a double diploma in maths kind of it's a bit weird to explain it's like instead of spending i don't know instead of having four lessons a week of maths you have eight lessons a week of maths and you like loads more and you get into universe some sort of university material um so i've you know i've taught that um yeah i i'm not sure how much i can you know how how i can answer your question in in the way that you intended me to because i think we're working in different systems here yeah yeah i've got some experience with some of that working with some kids who go to international schools and getting an ib degree um, worked with a kid um, via the internet, homeschool kid, overseas, um, A-level stuff and all that, you know, that kind of thing. We didn't get up to A-level, I think, because he was younger, but um, somewhat familiar with that. But you do um, in that, basically you go up through pre-calculus and calculus. Like calculus, like trigonometry is what we call pre-cal over here. Some um, analysis, the mathematical analysis you need before you get into calculus. Mm. Um, is that what y'all work on? Yeah, I mean, we have a bunch of things. We've got like, yeah, sure, you got you got algebra and trigonometry and calculus and probability theory and statistics and mechanics. So we kind of do like mathematical physics and um, uh, there's even a little bit of something called decision maths, which is kind of like about algorithms. It's sort of like linear programming, but it's basic computer science type of things um so yeah i mean it's pretty calculus heavy on the whole Mm -hmm. it's pretty physics oriented i would say Mm -hmm. and then on physics do you do both uh like calculus based physics over like when you're working with kids and non-calculus based um well do you mean are you asking me whether i teach that yeah i do teach both of those yeah okay yeah that's kind of what i was wondering right but cool um and so, let me see, look at my questions. Um, so what kept you interested in teaching? Like, why did you stay there instead of getting bored and not liking it like engineering and moving on to something else? <laughs> um, uh, well, that's not actually such an easy question. I guess <laughs> the, 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 high level, the high level answer is maybe something like A, um, I'm constantly learning things myself, so it's just something that interests me personally. Like I, I want to understand how I learn. Um, it's important to me. Secondly, um, I have the sense that learning about teaching, learning about learning, learning about education is 
basically a social good, and I would like to do good things uh, rather than evil things, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and then thirdly, it's just this. It's actually in, sometimes it's infuriating for this, but it's it's a really tough puzzle. It's like it, it's it's very hard to understand. I feel that I do understand some parts of it now, uh, or at least understand it reasonably well. But it's just a really tough puzzle to crack. It's a bit like sometimes it feels like chemistry before the periodic table. It's uh, lots of um, it's kind of it's it's hard to know how to link together all the all the facts. It's hard to know where to look for the most important things. I do tend to go on a kind of um, eclectic journey through lots of different sources. Uh, I have tended to do a lot of that, and yeah, I guess it's it's something that overall, as long as I have some sense that I'm making some progress, then I want to I want to keep going because if it's taken me this many years to figure out this little in a way. Then I suppose you could say a lot of people must be must must be really stuck or must not you know really not know anything about how this stuff works. So hopefully it's helpful to people. That's what that's my main motivation really is that it's helpful to people and that it's I suppose interesting for me. Yeah, yeah, kind of same here. It's uh, a very complicated subject. Teaching so much involved. Um, the subject you're working on, how it relates to human life, um, logic, knowledge, emotion, presenting material, dealing with people, um, a lot to it. Probably mm. one of the most complicated things there are out there. Yeah, it's pretty complicated, that's for sure. Yeah. But, cool. Um, and then, yeah, I like that there's always things to do and things to find out um it doesn't get so boring and redundant um because of the nature of it it is like you're saying and applying there's so many avenues of research and so much you can do on the journey hmm. um it keeps it very interesting all the time um so what are some of the things like what are some uh ideas that you had before about education that you've changed your mind about okay so now we're getting into the meat of things <laughs> okay so um well i think i think the number one uh the number one thing that i uh i suppose i regret advocating um to some extent is uh discovery learning although i didn't call it by that name at the time but yeah discovery learning so uh, this ties in with an important principle in cognitive science about uh, working memory and the limitations of working memory capacity. Uh, so uh, discovery learning is something that I encountered through through a few sources, but the main sources were uh, math circles, which is a, is a certain kind of way of teaching maths that actually I went to the United States specifically to attend a course hmm. about them because I was so interested in them and they, they really fascinated me and I thought they were really promising. And there's also this uh, really interesting article called Lockhart's Lament. It's actually called A Mathematician's Lament, but people normally refer to it as Lockhart's Lament because it's written by someone whose surname is Lockhart. I can't remember his first name. Uh, so, so he talks all about how um, it's unfortunate. In fact, unfortunate is a bit of a weak word. He, he's very strongly worded in his article uh, how it's basically terrible the way that we teach maths and that uh, we're, we're teaching kids like in order to make them trained monkeys and we're not really getting to them to think. And then he gave examples of what real thinking is like and what maths is really about and what maths is really like. And I could really sympathize with him. I was, I was kind of 50-50 on how much I agreed with him, but I could definitely sympathize with this point of view. And it did, um, it was part of this, this story around the math circles really, because they I haven't described what they're like, but basically it's you set a, a problem and then everyone works together on solving this this relatively large and often rather amorphous problem. Sometimes it's a, there can be times when the problem isn't actually very well stated, and part of the the process is to figure out how to state the problem better. Uh, although you don't tell them at the beginning that you've stated the problem poorly, um, so it's a, it is very interesting as a as a thinking exercise. Uh, but the trouble is that it's actually very very inefficient as a learning exercise um, because of well, I mean, because of the cognitive science around this sort of thing. I haven't, I haven't gone into loads and loads of detail on my podcast on this. I've mostly sort of 
made asides in various uh, episodes to talk about this, but I am planning a, a sort of a sequence of, of episodes to talk about this in great detail about uh, why why it's important to understand cognitive load theory or the limitations of working memory, as I mentioned. Now, I'm going to stop here because I could that now talk for 20 minutes about cognitive load theory. I don't know if that's what you want me to do. <laughs> Just talk on, yeah. You want to know more? Okay. So basically, it's this idea that we can split up the the mind into two parts. Actually, there's another source which I I refer to or I use where it's split up into three parts, um, but it doesn't really interfere. It's just basically the same model. So uh, splitting up into two parts, you've got working memory and long-term memory. And if you were to add a third part, then that would be essentially your emotions, like the emotional part of your, your mind, which is not really... Um, it's not really the same as your working memory or your long-term memory. So your working memory is kind of like what you're currently aware of, uh, what you can uh, remember from the last few seconds and, and what you're currently thinking about. So it's almost like your consciousness, basically, you can say is your working memory. And your long-term memory is all the stuff that you know, uh, all of your knowledge, basically, is in your long-term memory. And this includes... Um, so it's, it's a bit of a catch-all term, really, because it includes declarative knowledge and it includes procedural knowledge as well so things you know things you're able to do um uh, any kind of any kind of memory more or less that isn't short-term memory would would be classed as long-term uh, in your long-term memory and what happens when um what happens with your, your working memory that's very important is that it's limited in space it can only uh, it can only encompass a small number of ideas at a time uh, the number of ideas the thing about this is is that um, as soon as you start talking about ideas, then it's difficult to say, you know, what's how big is an idea and, and so on. So when I say number of ideas, it's not entirely clear how how many we can say, because obviously it depends on how big those ideas are and whatever it means to, for an idea to be big. But we're talking between about two to seven things can fit in your working memory at once. So it might be like seven digits that you could just re remember with no scheme just like a random string of digits. You could remember about seven digits, but you wouldn't be able to remember any more. And one of the digits would pop out of your memory, unless you had a special kind of uh, trick, which, which would uh, use your long-term memory as well as your, your working memory to do this. So um, what this means is that whenever you are thinking about something, your, your mind will be overloaded if you have more than a certain number of ideas that you're trying to combine at once. And when you have something like discovery learning, so you have a kind of a kind of, um, a problem where you're not told how to solve it or how to approach it and you're sort of meant to think about it on your own then there are too many different facets and too many different approaches to take and then you've got a limited amount of capacity in your working memory so you're going to end up as a beginner at least you're going to end up um, basically approaching it whatever way seems sensible to you and you're going to waste a lot of time thinking about things which don't actually contribute to your knowledge what would be a much more efficient way to do it which is much more normal teaching, basically, especially for beginners, is when you have a much more guided sense of what you're supposed to be doing, when you have a problem that is much more within the realm of, uh, it's basically like the problem is within the realm of your capacity. Um, you have some, um, so you know, you've just been shown a principle, for example, and then it's about application of that principle, and it's, it's, much, more, it's much more guided like that. Now, a lot of people have criticized that uh, for along the lines of things like that's boring or that doesn't get people to think but the cognitive science shows that that gets people to learn things and if you use discovery learning then they don't really learn very much at all uh, it, and this changes over over people's competence so it, the most important factor in learning styles um this is slightly moving into a different topic but but not really so there's this thing called learning styles which a lot of people are quite um you know believe in it's actually something like 90 percent of uh, university students in the US. I have a lot of data about the US because a lot of people write about it in English. Hmm. But it roughly, uh, but, but based on studies of, of this kind, roughly 90% of university students in the US will um, you know, have some sense of belief in the idea of learning styles. Uh, but the actual research shows that uh, there there is no evidence for any theory of, like there are no, a bunch of theories of learning styles, but there's actually no no evidence to support the theories really the only kind of thing that that is really important learning style wise is your level of competence so if you're a beginner you learn in one way and if you're intermediate you learn somewhat in another way and if you're advanced you learn in a different way so 
Discovery learning is something that can be used with people who are quite advanced. If someone is quite good at something, you can use discovery learning with them and it will work quite well. But if they're a beginner, it's going to work terribly. And this is part of the reason why it's so um, beguiling. It's part of the reason why it's, it's so easy to, to believe in, like I did, because I am effectively an expert. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm a, a mathematician whiz, but compared mm. to the kids I teach, I am a mathematician whiz. Right. I'm great yeah. at what I do compared to them. So when I see an interesting problem, I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. It gets me to think. And I actually probably would learn a lot by trying to solve like a really poorly formulated, uh, weird question. But the thing is, I've got loads of things already in my long term memory, which are helping me. and means I, I have to rely less on space in, in my in my working memory. I'm likely to take a, a good strategy. Uh, I'm likely to approach it in a good way. So it works better for me. Um, because I'm an expert and then but then it's, it's so easy and people do this all the time it's called expert blindness it's so easy mm -hmm. to sort of see your own competence and what you think is like oh but this is the way I learn or like this is the way that um, you know something that I think would, would get me to, to think or whatever and then uh, sort of assuming that uh, this is uh, this is going to work or this is going to be the best for whoever you're teaching who is a beginner and uh, trouble is it doesn't work that way yeah. And folks, really quickly, um, about the learning style things, I've got two podcasts we've done about that in the past. You can look them up with uh, teacher Scott Harris in San Antonio. Um, we've discussed that quite a bit as well. Um, one thing about the discovery, I think they might not be taken into account, is um, just general logic and how the mind functions. we still got to learn more about that. Um we already know some, so I think people need to get their epistemology right. Um, you know, of course, for those who don't know, theory of knowledge, um, what a concept is, what a proposition is, how we know things, what's truth, how we think. So logic is part of epistemology, but it's much more broad than that. Um, you know, I'm wondering if when we get more advanced with teaching and knowledge, um, when people get more unified on a good epistemology, discovery learning might be able to be used if people can sculpt it as like Montessori does. So if you can not just make up a discovery problem for kids, but you got to construct the whole context and environment for them and then do discovery within that. So maybe they can do this little discovery thing. Um, so it'd be kind of more like what you're saying, give them the principle and let them go. So they'd have some of that constructed already. But it sounds like it's like a discovery problem for someone who's advanced where you've already got this broader context to come up with these new tools that maybe haven't even been developed yet in math. Um, I think maybe that could be part of the thing, getting the context of the discovery right and couching it correctly, getting all the, ro the room and the furniture all set and then just going like that. Um, but I generally agree. So um, there are a few things to unpack there, if I may. A lot. So, yeah. so one, one is uh, you're talking about um, logic and epistemology, and the second thing is you're talking about Montessori education. So, uh, I think I'll I'll talk about Montessori first. So, I don't know huge amounts about Montessori education. I mean, I am basically familiar with the idea, and uh, I've read a book about it, but I haven't covered it on the podcast. But I don't I don't know like loads and loads. But from what I understand of Montessori education, it does seem like basically as you were just describing that you are setting up an environment in such a way that the environment effectively provides guidance. So it feels a bit like play, like mm -hmm. what the kids are doing, or in a way that what they're doing is play, but it, there is a kind of guidance towards some kind of instructional goal. And these things are very carefully, Maria Montessori herself very carefully designed these things to, to make that as much as possible uh, the case. So it does seem a bit like even though it might feel a bit like a discovery environment, there is a lot of guidance that's that's provided right. uh, by a careful design of the of the learning environment. That's that's my my view, my take on it. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and then the other thing about about uh, epistemology and logic. This is where um, this is another place where I mean, basically, I'm going to have to somewhat disagree with you. Uh, so, good. <laughs> so so logic. Um, is or okay? Let me. I'm going to try and. This, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get this very linear, but let me let me see what I can do. Um, so yes, it's important to uh, to understand epistemology when you're learning a, a field, like say 
uh, maths is a good example. So the epistemology of maths is based on um, deriving things uh, from axioms, right? A axiomatic proof. Well, is, maybe is that's the... what we um, are taught. And that's like the general consensus. But I'm not sure if that's actually true. I know someone who's doing some research on that. Um, I'll put a link to her in the podcast if I remember. But uh, I'm not sure, as I say, if that's well, actually it, it true, might... even though that's the conventional wisdom view. And I can't, I'm not genius enough to go one way or the other and actually prove one way or another. But yeah, but sorry, so... go ahead. Well, the the epistemology here. I mean, you you say you're raising doubts about that being the, the epistemology of maths, but I understand. I mean, do you mean something like it might be that research is actually not done that way? Is that what is that what your contention is, or do you yeah. mean like that's not how we know whether things are true or not? Um, for epistemology, or math in particular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you mean the first or the second? Do you mean, um, you know, maybe researchers actually work differently than that, or do you mean um, this isn't really the the way that we determine, you know, the ultimate arbiter of truth? Um, like for the axioms in math, you mean? Particular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, that idea comes about from Platonic thinking a long time ago um, from the ancient Greeks. And, yeah, well, they accepted it, and it's been conveyed forward in history. You know, that in itself doesn't make it correct. Um, if you look at, for example, how Galileo or Archimedes did some things, they didn't just deduce stuff, or even Newton. They looked at reality and then figured out how things worked and went from there. You know, okay. concrete things were springboards motivations um and sources to abstract from to develop the ideas like yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't see how you can deduce calculus from the axioms that's like th that idea is bizarre to me how you can like step by step deduce it i think we can get an idea and then just like physics you can put on a deductive basis after you've induced it i think math is similar um so we can get some ideas and yeah, we can relate them to the axioms, but that doesn't mean that's how we like, it doesn't mean math is essentially and entirely deductive and self-contained. I think there's uh, some problems with that. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question or do I need um, to at, at, at the end, it, it went, at the end, it went in a different direction than I expected. I mean, what, what it sounded like for most of what you were saying is that um, it, it looks like uh, it looks like people don't actually do research that way. They don't do research in a deductive way. They do research in a way where, like, you know, they use their intuitions and they use their experiences and and that informs the, you know, how they how they try and come up with new uh, theorems in maths or whatever. Um, but then at the end, you, you seem to say that that actually uh, that it, it might not be a real a good uh, a good basis for for truth itself. I mean, may, this might be going too far outside of the topic for, for you know, how much we have time for. But yeah. um, uh, I if anything, right, the, the, this is kind of moving into the sort of the point I was wanting to make, which cool. is that um, so it generally mathematicians will demand like proof as uh in order to to, to demonstrate things are true uh that's the normal way that like that's sort of ordinary maths that's the way it, that mathematicians like you know convince each other of new theorems um but uh but in terms of the way people think exactly you know that we, we can talk about the epistemology of maths and the standard epistemology of maths is, is the deduction from axioms right but um, but that's not the way that people think about it. That's like a lot of the time. That's not the way that people would, re would research it. And it's also not the way that people are likely to learn it. And that's because you made a point a little bit earlier about how maybe we'd be able to improve discovery learning or improve other aspects of learning by uh, focusing on epistemology. And I feel like that might be um, that might be, you know, I mean, in particular, given this is a good example of it. Right. If if the way that we decide whether things are true or not is different from the best way to learn them, then, then, you know, focusing on epistemology isn't going to improve the way people learn things that we, we need to look at it cognitively rather than, so we need to look at like how people think rather than how people ac accept 
uh, arguments about what is true, which is kind of what epistemology is more about. Well, um, I disagree. I mean, but that's one thing. It's, it's, I'm glad we're like having a discussion, get people to think about it. Just bringing up epistemology, what it is, because um, we're using the same word, but that doesn't mean we're talking about the same thing. And that's an important point. Um, or people can use the word teaching, but that doesn't mean they're talking about the same thing. Or someone can talk about learning or teaching to you, um, and they can have a certain meaning behind it. But because of all the study you've done, Stash, you've got you know so much more about it. Your experience, the books you've read, the thinking you've done, um, all the cognitive integrations you've made, it doesn't even make, mean the same thing. Um, but with epistemology, yeah, we'd have to define it give examples, see what the context is, see where we get the concept and all this stuff. And yeah, I don't know. If I, feel, wanna... I feel like we were just doing that right now, actually. <laughs> we were extent, just doing yeah. exactly those steps. But anyway, yeah. I mean, cool. uh, the other the other point that I wanted to, uh, to raise or to contest in a way was um, when, because I, I know, and this might be close to your heart, because I know, I mean, even the title of your podcast, Reason, uh, it seems like you're you're very, uh, from what I understand, you have a lot, a lot of like sort of philosophical and mathematical background. You, ha you have a lot of... Um, sort of uh belief in the importance of logic and and things like this right is, is, is that true do you have a lot of belief in the importance of logic um yes but then again yes like, okay. what is logic what does it mean so we okay. might not be talking uh, about the same thing but i'm glad you bring it up question right. it that's what we need i mean i i um i i'd like to think that we uh we have some sense of agreement about what what logic is but i mean it would it would really be a long conversation if you're we trying to decide what it is but um Anyway, uh, on the assumption that we're talking about the same thing, we're talking about logic. So I, I think this is a common, a, a very common and natural thing to say and think about education and about thinking. Is in, in fact, you see it in lots of places that people need, for example, to improve their thinking skills. So they need to be critical thinkers, or uh, they need to be um, logical thinkers, or they need to approach things rationally. I, I saw a book recently in a bookshop that said literally the title was why critical thinking will save us. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. And, and basically, so I'm pretty sure there's quite a big problem with this, right? That, that is that, th you know, what, what is deemed, um, logical or people will often give this criticism or level this criti criticism at someone. They'll say, this person just isn't thinking logically or this person just isn't thinking rationally. Whereas what's really happening is that that person is lacking some kind of knowledge or they're seeing things from a different perspective, which is all based on memory. It's all based on learned things rather than it's, it's all based on stuff they know or don't know rather than based on their, their skills in, in thinking. So, um, you know, you, um, it, it's even, it's even been shown that when you do something like suppose that um, so we're going back to maths, suppose that uh, you're teaching someone a logical set of steps, which and it is a logical set of steps, a logical set of steps to, for example, solve a certain kind of maths problem or, or prove a theorem. I mean, whatever, like do some maths thing, like solving a maths problem would be an example and um, or derive a certain formula. That would be that would be a, a, probably a better example. So every step you when you're doing it you feel like you are being logical you feel like you are going through a sequence of reasoned steps and it's like this and this produce this reasoned result and and it fe that's exactly what it feels like but actually what's going on is you're really remembering you're actually remembering a proof it's based on memory and so like most of reasoning is actually memory because again because of the limited size of the working memory capacity that you wouldn't be able to re like the first time you think about something hard like that, it's like your whole working memory is occupied and it's really hard to think about. It becomes increasingly easy to think about because you're increasingly relying on your memory rather than relying on your conscious ability to think, right? It's, it's like things are coming back from your memory. And the idea of things, you know, things can be, can be reasonable because they make sense, but they make sense because you've already inserted them into your knowledge base. You've already inserted them into your, into your long-term memory. So, in, in fact, um, a lot of the time, you know, I mean, it's easy to do it with people, for example, with literacy as well. If somebody can't understand uh, a passage with a reading, it's easy to say something like, well, they need to think critically about this text or they need to uh, or some, some such similar injunction. But in fact, 
much of the time it's something like they don't have the requisite vocabulary and that's why they're stuck. So they need more knowledge, right? Vocabulary is knowledge. Or they don't understand the meaning of the terms in the passage. Well, that's basically vocabulary as well. It might be that they've heard of these terms, but they don't understand them in detail. And then that's, again, knowledge. It's like knowledge is, is much more important to thinking than is commonly understood. But, um, but then, I, you know, the way a lot of people use the word logic, I disagree, because I don't think a lot of people really know what they mean. Um, they, don't have, and they don't have a valid concept of logic there's a lot of because of all the philosophical influences out there um i think a lot of people are mistaken to various degrees about what it is and so even like logic thinking science a lot of people throw the words around or they think they're a phd in science they have a phd in science so they know what it is but if that was the case then johns hopkins wouldn't have to have their r3 program um in like a, a biological medical field um, there's R3 program, they've got to teach their graduate students how to do science, how to think, how to be logical, because they're not learning it in high school, they're not learning it in their undergrad. And these people at, um, in the program found out, you know, by looking at what scientists are doing, practicing scientists, you've already had their PhD, um, that's the evidence they've used to get their conclusion that it's not being learned. And so they got to institute this R3 program to help out their grad students. Um, you know, and like Rice, one of the better, like number 16 university in the US, they have to have an engineering leadership program, teaches engineers different things like entrepreneurship, um, how to communicate, how to think, some things like that, some things beyond the quote unquote traditional program of just memorization. Um, and then, you know, having a degree in philosophy, knowing the background of it, um, knowing something about the history of it, um, knowing some, but of course, being a student, never calling myself a master, because I know there's all kinds of things to learn forever, but uh, a lot of mistakes in philosophy about what logic and epistemo epistemology are that are conveyed out into the general culture. Um, so some people might think they're being logical, but... I would question whether they know what logic actually is. Um, and even some researchers who are doing work on it, um, I wouldn't agree with whether they're actually doing science or logic. Um, and like, I'm not the only one, you know, you got those people at the universities or, um, let's see, forgot this lady who wrote this book about, uh, food in America. I'll put it in the show notes, but with the research she did for the book, looking at so-called scientific research about food and fat and health, you know, she's come to the point where she no longer believes any scientific research until she's looked at it herself, the evidence, the reasoning, um, what they're saying. Um, so I think there's that broader context we need to look at. Um, about whether just, just people are being logical and sorry what uh just about the the last point with the food lady um uh, lady looking at nutrition science yeah i mean this that feels very uh it feels somewhat reminiscent to what the state is a bit in the education world yeah. it feels like just unfortunately like what you said about brain-based learning and that one the book about uh, brain-based learning that you had a podcast about yeah same thing i like that um episode i'd recommend that too I think maybe I'll link to the like your podcast in general, but maybe to some specific episodes, the ones that I've heard, um, just because I've heard them, not that they're the best, but John Wooden, Bruce Lee, the one about brain-based learning, um, that was really good. Sure, thank you. But yeah, I'm glad you're bringing up some of these ideas and having some disagreement for discussion, get people to think about this, get each of us to think about this stuff more, add a different perspective, um, that's good. Um, but so we were talking about, um, discovery learning and the circles thing. Then we had to, yeah, circles, then you yeah. had to get into some, uh, short-term memory and long-term memory. Um, mm -hmm. could we like circle back, not to, like no pun intended, but could we circle <laughs> back to the circles thing and like, um, 
What was that exactly? Could you like define that and describe that in yeah. more detail, please? Or did I miss sure. that? Sure. So, so this is actually inspired by. Uh, it was actually inspired by a Russian thing originally. Uh, they had these literature circles where people would come together and they'd all read a book and then they'd talk about it with each other. And then they started doing this with maths, where that you'd have a problem and you'd work on it together, and it would be mm-hmm. and you know it'd be fun for the people. <clears throat> and then they. Um, started trying this kind of thing in, in other countries. It was actually in a few different countries in Eastern Europe, and then uh, some enterprising individuals took it over to the United States. And uh, there's kind of two schools of this. So there are some people who do this to prepare for competition, like mass competition, like, like the Mathematical Olympiad. And there are some people who do it in a much more kind of open and, and just kind of let's think about maths and enjoy it kind of way. And um, it does seem... I mean, I've actually tried to teach... I've, I've been on a course, I've tried to teach some... Um, my experience of it is much less positive. My direct experience of it is much less positive than what I read about. And I wondered how much that's my own mm. skills. Um, I do feel like it, and, and there is a little bit of evidence around discovery learning that um, sometimes it has a positive impact on motivation and on attitudes. So sometimes people just come out feeling like they like maths more, which is great. Um, but it does seem like you can't really make it the core of, um, you know, there's, there are some cognitive reasons why this can be problematic basically and uh which i've been digging into yeah that's what i'd say hmm. okay now i get what you mean by circles i thought you meant something different but then with the idea of like literary circle and people reading books that makes it more makes it make more sense thank you yeah and i think um now that yeah mentioning the discovery thing and all that i think um i'm having a student working with a student now Algebra 2, he's having trouble with the exact same thing because his teacher thinks that um, it's like the greatest thing since sliced bread or whatever. And he claims MIT does this and MIT has success. And so that's what he's going to do to teach. <laughs> and he gives the students these problems. And this kid is just lost, you know, like mm. they're doing um, some probability in the binomial distribution. And mm-hmm. instead of starting out with the basics, developing the binomial distribution, doing some simple everyday problems so students can do something familiar and get a concept mm. of it and then expanding from there and then starting to connect that idea in math to other ideas in math in, in the world. It's just out of nowhere, you get this like abstract problem and all of a sudden you got to use the binomial like distribution and it's just crazy. Yeah, this sounds like exactly a demonstration or a very good example of, of the kind of problem that you'd encounter. Um, yeah, it seems like, you know, lots of it might even be that a small number of people in the class are coping and even thriving. But like I imagine most or, or most of the kids in that class are just going to have a really hard time of it. They're like, what is going on? I'm completely lost. And that's exactly, you know, it's basically working memory overload. Like they can't there's too much information. They don't know what's relevant. They don't know how to connect it. Yeah. They don't know what to do. And then they just have a sense of you know, it's exasperation and, and potentially just sense of failure because, you know, that they, they try and it's just too much and they don't know where they're going to go with it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, like in this one. So last night, the guy had four problems. He can choose one of the four and he chose this problem about, OK, you had a multiple choice test, four questions, um, four, sorry, four uh possibilities a b c d for 20 questions 20 questions a b c d on each one um and they go through um what's the probability of getting one question right what's the probability of getting 10 again out of nowhere when they haven't really developed this stuff much and all of a sudden Mm. there's this question that says um it starts talking about um you have 20 rows and a thousand balls and a 0.25 probability and then 10 11 up through 20 are bins and okay so what's the probability of getting these different things and they're like bins balls where the heck did balls and bins come from it's like i can't handle this you know and yeah so thankfully i was there to help him relate it okay a thousand balls would be like a thousand students you got the same thing done a thousand times the bins like would be getting 10 questions right 11 right 20 right but yeah Mm. it's like um not not to mention that there's a serious mathematical modeling problem with assuming that (laughs) people people choose random answers to multiple choice questions yeah 
I mean, unless it says something like so, somebody doesn't know anything and they're yeah. just randomly picking questions. But, you know, they probably didn't say that. Anyway. Yeah, it did. That was um, the context. It's like, oh, okay. pretend <laughs> they do it randomly. But yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. But that's a good point. But, uh, okay. So that makes more sense about the circles and discovery learning stuff. Mm. Um, anything else you, you want to add on that? Like, Well, I mean, I feel like we've been talking about it for a while. And I know that there are some other things you wanted to ask me about. So I thought I'd uh, just give you a chance for that yeah um but yeah a lot of good discussion there that could be developed a lot more um so you're doing some teaching of math and physics and you're working on some electronic um web-based learning platforms and things so what the heck do you learn from a basketball coach john wooden <laughs> okay nice question yeah um so so i i went out looking for the best teachers of any kind that i could find and i found yeah. three i found three who are really good unfortunately i mean I, there's, there's this general sort of uh kind of bias in the literature to the united states if you're in the united states it probably it doesn't matter or feel like that way to you but i live in a different country very far away and you know i've, I've read more books from the, like just way more books from the united states than from the rest of the world combined hmm. i've read like one book from new zealand and you know a handful from the i don't know maybe like 10 or so i don't know how many but you know that kind of scale from the uk and we're talking a scale of like 100 or something from the us so i feel like there must hmm. be great teachers in the rest of the world but i just happen mm -hmm. to find these three okay. um so actually they're not all from uh the, the us but they're all taught in the us and one of them is john wooden who are the wooden others? like uh, Marva Collins, I mentioned her, mm. uh, sorry, I've heard her mentioned on your podcast before, actually. Okay, Marva cool. Collins and uh, uh, Jaime Escalante. Mm, okay. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's also a maths guy. Anyway, so they, they, interestingly, we have an interesting sample because they all taught different ages and they all taught um, uh, if different age groups. Um, they all taught different subjects as well. So Marva Collins was really, her big thing was literacy and, and literature um, and primary school. Or the you know, elementary school, and John Wooden was a university student teaching a basketball, and then uh, Jaime Escalante was this uh, high school maths guy, right? So we got different mm -hmm. ages and stuff. So I was looking at all of those, and John Wooden, yeah, I mean, he was an extraordinary coach. Um, he he his his achievements speak for themselves, mm -hmm. for themselves. Like he he won something like his team won nine out of ten years in uh, the, the university basketball um, competitions mm -hmm. in the in the US well, yeah. and he was universally revered by his I mean revered I'm not sure if that's a great word but he, he was basically he was considered to be wonderful by everyone who knew him uh, well, enough so that one of his former students actually wrote this book about him uh, actually in collaboration with someone else and uh, yeah I mean he He's he's just he's awesome. So that's why I wanted to read about him. Mm -hmm. um, what did you learn? What did I learn? Uh, I think so. In a way, I feel like I learned the most by combining what I learned from him with what I learned from the other two cases. I think that some of the biggest learning points were um, that he. He was very intense. They were all so intense. So intense in terms of like the the way that they the way that they transmitted knowledge. They were constantly talking about content all the time. Um, so this is actually some people went to study him to actually observe his lessons. His you know what lessons you know training training uh, sessions right with his team, and he would. They, they expected him, based on the psychology available at the time, they expected that he would be using a lot of different motivational, uh, they would be giving them rewards or punishments or something, you know, that he'd be, uh, it would mostly be about encouragement. But actually, it was not mostly about encouragement. Actually, it was mostly about content. It was mostly about, don't do this, do that, you know, change this, change that. And he had everything planned in an incredibly time efficient way. So everyone was constantly moving. And then the the switches between exercises were lightning fast. So there was just no, no break and everything was, um, all the time was used to maximum effect. Another thing that I got from him and from the others, but maybe from him the strongest, was the incredible focus on fundamentals. 
just this huge focus on you need to be able to do the most basic, basic, basic things. And we're going to practice it every single week. And you practice it every single week, including right up to the final match in the year. You know, they were doing basic passing exercises and things like that. I don't know very much about basketball, but these sorts of basic <laughs> exercises that they were doing, you know, right up to the very last match. When no, other people would just be talking about higher level concepts about strategy. You know, they'd be talking about stuff like that. I mean, they would also do that, but they would never stop working on the fundamentals um, and make sure they were like really, really, really ingrained so that, I mean, again, this is a working memory, long-term memory thing, so that it was really strongly in their long-term memory so they don't have to occupy their working memory with it when they do it, right? So they can spend, that they can automatically do a really good pass. They don't have to think about doing a good pass. They can think about the strategy because they've got that, that mm-hmm. space in their head. Think about it because they've just really honed this. So, um, that was another big thing, his use of drill. So his, his really intense, high content um, use of drill um, in order to get into the fundamentals. Like he was, he was really making sure that was happening. Um, he was uh, perceived as very fair to everyone. He was perceived as someone who was, uh, uh, you know, d- didn't show any favoritism uh, or anything like that. I suppose, I mean, that, that, that's good. I mean, people just saw him sort of as a very moral uh, person, a moral figure. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, he, he, he used planning. That's another thing. He, he planned his sessions so that he could be so intense and so that he could focus on fundamentals that much like that. He really, uh, he really sort of saw his planning time as sacred in its own way. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that's also really inspiring about all three of these cases, all three of these teachers is that they all had serious disadvantages. So in the case of the other two teachers, hmm. they were dealing with uh, populations which tend to be uh, tend to achieve poorly, or at least at the time. I mean, I think it might still be probably it. Well, actually, it is still true. So, you know, Marva Collins was was in a, a kind of a poor black neighborhood. Um, the expectations. It was not very long after civil rights as well. So Chicago, right? Chicago, yeah. So, so like the expectations of the kids were very low, and the kids had very low expectations of themselves, and she really turned that around. Um, then uh, Jaime Escalante was in a school with predominantly Latino kids and that had a similar kind of it actually originally that school had some serious problems with gangs and stuff and we see a lot of him trying to cope with that in, in looking at his story and was it about and to be with, closed what was the deal with that one yeah yeah they had to they switched out uh, some different uh, head like principals school principals in order to fix it and um yeah, it was it was pretty close to closing at one point. It turns out, I mean, it's a long story, but it turns out that one of the principals tried to kind of negotiate with the gangs and get everyone to love each other, and that failed terribly. And you, it he talks an about it. Sorry, uh, Stash talks about it more in his podcast about that. So you can listen to that podcast. It's worth it. Really good ones about Wooden and all that. But sorry, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so he th- there was this disastrous case of of him trying to get everyone to love each other, and it totally didn't work. And then there was another guy who tried to have a much more firm hand against that kind of thing. And it really, it helped, to some extent, it helped turn the school around. Um, so, yeah, anyway, I mean, I'm just saying that those two teachers, uh, Marvin Collins and Jaime Escalante, had a uh, difficult sort of um, hand dealt to them in terms of the kids they were, they were dealing with. John Wooden had his own difficulties because he didn't have a gym. He had to, you know, the, the hmm. university normally has a basketball court. He didn't actually have a basketball court. He still won the competitions. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. they had to like find ones out somewhere in town. Like wow. they were so underfunded. He was actually paid very little. So, um, so you know, he had some sort of material things which you could easily complain and make excuses about. But you know, it's obviously very admirable in him that he he not only did he do what he could, but he ended up having an enormous success uh, by by finding ways around it. Well, yeah, I've read um, one book, but the guy said that. A lot of people who are very successful come from, you know, like poor, disadvantaged environments, like Brazilian soccer players. Um, I don't think he talked about these people, but they go with what he says. Um, when things are all luxurious and taken advantage of, um, everything's taken care of, people seem to be like sloppy and don't strive as hard as they do in these situations. You might be talking about the book Bounce by Matthew Syed. No, it's a different one. But thanks, I'll, thanks for mentioning that. I have to like maybe look that up because um, yeah. I haven't read so, Bounce or even heard of it. But go ahead, sorry, what? Yeah, I, I actually covered that one as well. But um, oh, okay, cool. 
Yeah, but Bounce, uh, but he took it, it's sort of a side point, but he mentions how because he he's a ping pong champion, like table tennis. Hmm. Well, not champion, but he was like reaching semi finals in the Olympics, this kind of level. Hmm. Um, and he he talks about how um, how how he, basically how they did it, and an element of it is that they had this really uh, this kind of this garage where they had a table tennis table and it was pretty small and there were loads of weeds everywhere. And it was really hot in summer, <laughs> really cold in winter. And he's, yeah, and then he describes a Spartak um, tennis club, which is where a lot of the best uh, Russian, uh, Russian tennis players have come from like Anna Kornikova and et cetera. Huh. And Spartak is apparently also some sort of like really desolate post-industrial looking awful place. Hmm. Um, and, that, and th- this, Describes one or two other places like that and, and says how it seems to him or apparently, you know, when you have uh, this kind of rough looking, you know, rough edges, then maybe this gets people to work harder. I mean, it's difficult to know for sure, but it's interesting as an observation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, and uh, one thing that's interesting about the John Wooden thing that I thought of, um, how he would prepare a lot for the practices and they were very designed so that's kind of like what Montessori did put a lot of thought into the design kind of make that design or preparation sacred and then kind of let the students go mm. um, yeah that's a, that's a great uh, connection there actually so thanks. I think that on a on a very deep fundamental level yeah both of them are designing um, kind of pedagogical experiences one of them with the idea that, it, that there's not going to be an instructor there. So that's the Mario Montessori type mm-hmm. of idea. Whereas the other one is designing one with the idea, well, there is going to be an instructor there, which is John Wooden himself. And he's going to be, you know, prodding people and telling them what to do all the time. And uh, he's sort of using himself as a, as a resource, kind of. I think I get the sense, and again, I, this is where my knowledge is a bit limited, but I get the sense that part of the Mar- Mario Montessori way of, of thinking is about the idea that there's... Um, there's a wonderful word, iatrogenics, uh, which is, it comes from this guy called Nassim Taleb, uh, who hmm. writes about randomness. Anyway, but uh, he talks about how, you know, sometimes doctors cause you harm because they feel like they need to do something. But if you were left alone, you'd, you'd actually yeah. fare better. Mm-hmm. And, and there are some people who talk about how it's possible for a teacher to do that. It's possible for an instructor to actually get in the way of learning. Oh, yeah. And I feel that there's a little bit of that spirit in, in some of what, Mar- um, sorry, Mario Montessori was thinking and i think maybe you know i think there is a bit of room for that maybe in like um really young kids for example because like they just need a lot of free play mm-hmm. uh to, to a large extent and and it seems that by you know her kind of uh, thinking again it might i may get this wrong because i don't know that much about the montessori method but to some extent it seems like her way of thinking is uh if you minimize the amount of time that a teacher or instructor has to be involved in the kid kind of has more of a sense of freedom and more of a sense of play which is good for the kid but at the same time you know if you structure the pedagogical environment really carefully then you can provide enough guidance that they actually end up learning for example the alphabet at a very young age mm-hmm. hmm. and so you think she had like the idea you're talking about you think she would maybe interfere a little bit too much like to be a teacher like that or what i i think that well, again, I'm, I'm worried about stepping into things I don't know that much about. But it, I get the sense that part of the philosophy is that um, young kids don't want you to, to prod them, <laughs> mm. you know, and it's not going to be good for their development uh, at some level, you know, when they're learning stuff. Um, I think that's at least the philosophy behind it. Again, I'm just going to have to keep on caveating that I'm stepping into the unknown a bit with these speculations. Yeah. And so you're saying she would not be one of the ones that would interfere too much? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's from what I know about it, too. Um, and then, of course, there's like Montessori done right versus people who claim they're Montessori but are not actually. I can believe that, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know about that. So. Yeah, so there are some schools that claim they're Montessori, which are not really Montessori because they don't follow the principles, don't follow the fundamentals. Okay. Um, and so I think um, didn't. Escalani and Collins prepare a lot too. They were very well prepared, everything laid out ahead of time. Yeah, um, so it comes across um, 
it comes so interestingly with John Wooden it comes across much more um, in the book much more explicitly we mm -hmm. hear about his special time you're not allowed to interrupt his special mm -hmm. time nobody can come in and interfere with it it's his, it's his hour where he has to be it's like being in church or something you know it's like you, you just mm -hmm. can't come in and tell him anything like he's busy interesting you know, in a special kind of busy right whereas um, with Marva Collins uh, we actually in her book uh, see her talking about how important it is to prepare but we don't see very much of like what her pre preparation schedule or activities were actually like we just hear her saying you know preparation is really important make sure you're prepared but she there's no demonstration in the book of exactly what it looks like for her uh, with Escalante then we again I mean mostly that that book about Escalante they're all written a little bit differently that one doesn't uh, say very much of what his opinion is directly we just have like quoted speech from him for example to get a sense of some of his ideas we mainly see him through his actions whereas in the in the marvel Collins book we, we do hear some of her own words and what she thinks so with with escalante i think the main thing is that we see him in a number of cases looking at things he's trying to teach and trying to find ways to teach it and that's kind of uh his long-term if you like preparation as he builds up ways of they're often very silly he, he uses humor a lot uh, very silly ways of uh, of approaching math stuff, but then it does hook the kids because they kind of get into his 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 special world that he builds around this. It, even for example, he has his own vocabulary, his own name for various things in math. He says stuff like "secret agent" is mm -hmm. his name for a minus sign outside of set of brackets, so you need to flip the signs. Or like uh, "rifle pass" from Magic Johnson is his word for straight line. Um, and he just he just like makes this stuff up and you know it's kind of a, a special he has a special bond with the kids around it basically it's like a, a kind of inside inside a conspiracy of, of maths <laughs> it's kind of funny I guess huh, yeah. Uh, yeah then it makes it more real and more concrete adds more drama to it mm. hmm. but uh, so um, what was I going to say something about the preparation um, so, oh yeah, I was going to say, um, it's good that at least some of them, you get to deal with that. I think that's one thing that comes up in the history of science too. Um, in ancient Greece, people used to just present their final conclusions and then Galileo and Newton were affected to some extent like that. But, um, Kepler, for example, was one of the first ones I think to, present the mistakes he made in his process of learning and describe mm. how he did things and i think that's very important i think newton that's did very, that to some very extent. interesting yeah it's fascinating yeah um and then thankfully we've got a little bit of the what um how do you pronounce it amagast from archimedes so we learned a little bit about how he discovered some of the theorems he did um mm. he'd get pieces of wood i guess have um have a shape he wanted have someone cut it for him and then put it in some water and see when the solid was stable and when it wasn't and then he'd know when it was stable he'd know he had a, he had a theorem hmm oh i didn't know i i know about another method he had but i didn't know about that one which one are you oh, he, he he had this kind of integration like sort of calculus like approach to some problems which was only discovered uh in something like 10 or 20 years ago like huh. it was it turned wow. up in a hmm. in a book in a monastery um wow. so just yeah people just noticed this it, um the 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 parchment that this thing these things are written on sometimes they scrub the ink out of the parchment and mm -hmm. then rewrote over it but then the ink would seep out again over time so you could actually hmm. see even though they, they'd written some whatever it was uh, could have been a copy of the bible for example onto this parchment then uh then actually you saw some of his kind of you know Archimedes drawings of how he approaches problems was seeping out of the parchment and then they managed uh, to and from this Greek uh, monastery they managed to get some historians of science in to document wow, that stuff interesting. yeah like briefly what was the thing he knew about calculus um to be honest I I, I don't really remember it well enough yeah. uh, but I'm he was like using a kind of uh, analytical basically like a sort of limit like method of huh. cutting things into very small pieces in order to solve oh. some problems okay yeah i think i'm familiar with that then good cool um but yeah so that's one thing i try to do a lot more when i'm teaching or in general try to talk about the how not just the what um 
And I look forward to reading some of these, listening on Audible or reading some of these books that you've talked about in your podcast, um, listening to some of your podcasts on them again. It's like uh, some good material. Um, I recommend it for folks. But, uh, and then one thing I like in um, some of the podcasts you've done in this stuff, um, we mentioned the fundamentals with John Wooden, but mm -hmm. uh, so a little context first, like when I was getting my teacher's credentials in Texas, I had some professor who was all proud of herself because instead of calling some things worksheets, um, you know, they didn't like drill. They call it drill and kill at the time. Drills all mm. bad. Don't do any drill. Don't do practice. Just do creative stuff. And mm. this like 40 or 50 year old would all puff herself up with fake pride and call them work shits. She thought that was just <laughs> the greatest thing. It's like, I'm so clever. <laughs> They're work shits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was sad. Um, and of course I couldn't say anything cause I'm a little kid. So, you know, to them getting a degree and they're just going to think I'm stupid. And I've even had some of that happen, you know, but, um, but yeah, I like that you, in talking about these different great teachers, bring up the fact and stress the fact that drill is very important. And you've already said it some here, um, in this podcast episode, you get the drill, um, do drill, get some of the stuff down and then you're freed up for to be more creative as you said the basketball players could be they got some of the exactly, passes down exactly yeah and have you heard about some of that in um what is it gtd um what david allen i think getting things done i think he talks about some of that too how um some people say our mind is better at being creative than at memorizing stuff and so one thing he does in the GTD method to help people be more productive at work, I think specifically he works with executives, business executives. He recommends writing things down or keeping a recorder with you and making verbal notes throughout the day and then writing them down at the end of the day. Hmm. Um, so he recommends writing things down a lot to free your mind up to be creative. That's that's an interesting connection here with this kind of thinking. Actually, there's uh, something called the uh, the Zeigarnik effect, which you, is relevant as well. How do you spell that? You, uh, Z e i g a r n i k, Zeigarnik effect. It's named after a psychologist. Spell um, it one more time, if you would please. Z e i g. Sorry, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. that's right. Uh, Z, what do you call it? Z over here. <laughs> Z yeah, yeah. E e i g um, a r n i k. Zagarnik. Okay. Thanks. Yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, to give maybe a brief uh, story about the Zagarnik effect, this is uh, there was originally inspired by a situation where some psychologists went to have lunch somewhere, and then the waiter uh, took an order of maybe something like ten people's food, ten people's order, and he took it all in his head, and he didn't wow. write anything down. And then came out with exactly the right stuff. And they were all so surprised that he could remember all those different things. And afterwards, one of the psychologists came up to him and said, well, it's amazing that you could remember that I had whatever it was, you know, that I had the, the, the salmon. I don't know. And then he said, what? Like, you had the salmon? I don't remember. <laughs> so, he, <laughs> so he could remember them all, but he, could, he forgot them all immediately afterwards once he gave them out. I mean, in, any, in a huh. sense, you could think this is a little bit reminiscent of um, sometimes what people do when they cram for a test. Uh, they, do basic, they do a little bit something like that. Um, but yeah, uh, th this, is, this has got to do with, there's this kind of mental effect where if you need a piece of information now or soon, it will sort of take up some of your mental space, so to speak. But then once you don't need it anymore, you just forget it. Um, and, you know, unless you've gone through some sort of process where you've uh, been committed it, committing it to memory. Um, so, yeah, in terms of I do want to touch on what you're saying about drill and kill and about memorization, about creativity. So I really like the way you phrased it with, um, you know, uh, if you get that, if you get some fundamental stuff down, you've got the space to be creative. And that's a really important idea, I think. Um, mm. That's a powerful idea. And so um, now with 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 things like so okay go, talking about memorization it's important to recognize how important memory is to learning and that learning is largely mm. or possibly entirely 
about hmm. memory. And the thing is, like, memorizing, usually what that means is some kind of completely, is, is basically, it seems very dry, and it is very dry, to just get a new fact and stick it in your head any way you can, and it's just completely, it's quite disconnected from everything. Now, there are some cases where, so basically, that's really inefficient, and people recognize that. They go, well, it's, you know, it's hard for me to memorize things. I don't seem to get very far. And afterwards, the results don't feel very good because I just have a few isolated facts which easily disappear from my memory. And the thing is, I think the way to think about that kind of memorization isn't that it should never, ever, ever, ever be used, but just that it's a very inefficient method, but sometimes you don't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I mean, for example, uh, learning vocabulary in a foreign language, sometimes there are ways to make it easier. But a lot of the time, unfortunately, you don't really have another choice and you kind of have to do that. But if you know that, you know, if you like... Uh, it gets better because you can start to like form sentences and you connect words together a bit more and then they're easier to remember in your mind. But, you know, sometimes it, there are some things you need to know and you, you just have no other recourse but to use that method. If you do have another method, then that's great. I mean, the best thing is to connect it with something you already know. And that's why you have a Matthew effect in education, was a big reason why you have a Matthew effect in education, that the rich get richer. And in terms of knowledge, the people who already know a lot will learn faster than the people who don't know very much yet. Mm -hmm. Because they can connect new knowledge to their existing knowledge and it, it is preserved better because they have a, it makes sense to them because it's connected and it can only be connected because they had that previous knowledge. So it's kind of, it grows in a kind of exponential fashion that the more you have, the easier it is to get more. And conversely, if you have less, then it's harder to actually even make a start. Uh, so, um, so yeah, that's what I'd say about, about memorization and, uh, and drill. Um, it's 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 certainly also the case that you don't need to use drill literally all the time. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's a tool and you have to use it in the right context. and You have yeah. to be sensitive to whether someone is a beginner in something and how much background knowledge they have. But to to simply demonize it as as a as a kind of a taboo method is, um, I think, a you know, it's a bit of a silly position to hold. Mm hmm. I, I think the world isn't really divided into people who believe in constantly drilling and doing nothing else yeah. and other people who believe in never drilling and only ever being creative. I think, you know, if you look at the really good teachers, they do use this method when they need it. Um, Marva Collins did an awful lot in order to get the kids to, to learn phonics. She did loads of drilling. That's what they needed. Then they started reading amazing books and she started having incredible intellectual discussions with them at a level which would, you know, it'd be intellectually satisfying even for me as, a, as an yeah. adult with a reasonable education, you know, like, but these were eight year olds, but they yeah. were having amazing high quality conversations. They needed to learn how to read the alphabet <laughs> mm -hmm. and they had to use drill, <laughs> you know, but like, it's not like she was drilling them the whole time. It's like she needed it for that section and then she started doing other things. It's a, it's a tool that you can use appropriately. I think yeah. you might have asked me a question and I just went off on one completely different side, but hopefully that was uh, relevant to what you were talking about. Yeah, basically. Um... It's an open-ended question. <laughs> Different things you can say, not a multiple choice. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I think that's what John Wooden did more anyway. He put drill in context. Um, from what I understand, it'd be in the in the practice. I don't think the players ever stood around and just passed the ball back and forth to each other in a straight line or anything, right? That I, I mean, I'm sure he, he definitely had exercises around passing, but he would have made them the kind of exercises that were both physically demanding and actually develop their skill. There wouldn't yeah. be things that would be like, well, this is so easy. Why are we, you know, this isn't really stretching us. They always were feeling stretched. Yeah. So he probably had some kind of passing exercise which, uh, which made them feel stretched. I mean, he, he had lots of levers he could pull. You know, if there was an yeah. exercise that, that they were like, this is, this is, look, he looked at them and they looked like they weren't working that hard, he would just speed the same exercise up. Hmm. He'd be like, okay, do the same thing, but do like, you know, do it 50% faster. And he would, he would be able to make that happen. And that would, that would push them. So he always had a way of doing it. And that's interesting. It's like the same thing he's doing to his players. He's had to do to himself. He's got to have all this stuff down, memorized, mastered so that he can adapt and be creative in the situation hmm. and go with the flow. Hmm. You got to drill. Okay. Let's speed it up. You got to know to speed it up. Um, the way you're saying that, are you agreeing or disagreeing? <laughs> no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, I mean, yeah. I, I think it's it's important to recognize that that the preparation was a major part of that. That he didn't only rely on his ability to crack out the right thing at the right moment. 
um, he did obviously preparation was a part of uh, it's kind of like a I mean crutch is a bad word but it's kind of like um, it's a way to make sure that he would uh, he would still be running a good session um, uh, even if things started to become overwhelming for him as, a, as an instructor it, as in it wouldn't become overwhelming because he'd prepared uh, but certainly I'm sure that you know, teachers definitely get better with time. We we see mm-hmm. it with um, yeah. In in various cases, like we see, I'm sure it was true of John Wooden as well. Uh, he was actually an English teacher as well, but we don't hear much about that side of his life. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, uh, but um, so Marva Collins, she had more than ten years of experience before we actually see her do what she does. So she had this whole long period of learning to be a better teacher. Same with Jaime Escalante, we actually see it in much more detail. And that's how, one thing, sorry to interrupt, but that's one thing I like. You talk about, in talking about Jaime Escalante, people ought to listen to that in the book, and therefore in your episode, you talk specifically about how he developed some stuff he was doing wrong, how he changed. That's like very valuable. But go mm, ahead, sorry. Mm. Yeah, it is valuable. It is also quite inspiring. It's inspiring to see your heroes when they were beginners. Yeah. Then it helps yeah. us see that even though we might be crap or think we're crap, it's something we can improve. Yay. Well, yeah. I mean, this is a fundamental part of a, a good mindset for learning and education. It's like, yeah, you probably are crap. Like, just you, you, you're probably going to have to live with that for now. But look, if you put the work in, you could be like this incredible heroic individual. Like, the difference between you and them is mainly work. Yeah. And, yeah, that's a good point. And we'll maybe close on that. I got someone else I got to get ready for in half an hour. I need some coffee. My brain's getting like, um, seems like it's only working on 70% now. I need a little more coffee to like kick things up. Um, yeah. Getting a little brain dead just because of, uh, I guess, sleep wasn't good quality last night. Kept waking up a bit. But I think that's it. Because um, it sure the heck ain't the discussion. This is like nice. So, uh, hope you enjoy that, folks. Um, Stash, do you have any last words for today? That's all. Thanks very much for inviting me to the podcast. Yeah, I uh, enjoyed the discussion. Very valuable. I like some of the disagreements we had, too. It's important getting us to think about things, um, see that a topic's relevant, question what we believe, um, learn more about it, think more about it, maybe develop our idea more or change our opinion um, if we find we're wrong. It's awesome. But, uh, and then hopefully you can come back on sometime. There's so much more to discuss, like, um, Bruce Lee, what you say about the brain-based learning. Mm. Um, I like what you say about, and, you know, develop more what you've said in your podcast about, um, Wooden and Escalante, um, how they were very intense, but then Wooden was more laid back, but, Escalante sometimes would he learned from like he and some people he learned from would maybe um do a like insult someone sometimes just for a purpose <laughs> and things like that um yeah, he, really he was a very particular very very unusual character it's, it's, <laughs> uh, he, he had a special way of connecting with his students which did involve some apparently uh insulting them from time to time yeah yeah so that's like He's not being rude. I like that. It's like insulting, but it's like the tough love thing, I think. Mm. Maybe the way some people put it. But mm. cool. So, but um, awesome. And thank you again for being on the podcast. And do you have any last words? No, that's all. It's my pleasure. <laughs> cool. All right. Awesome. Hope you enjoyed it, folks. And uh, we will talk to you all again soon. Um, and if you have any questions, let us know. Thanks, folks. Bye.